who's online. Hello, everybody. Wait a minute, I gotta hit this. Who's online? Okay, we got it. We're recording. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming to the History of Diving Museum. We're glad that you're here this evening. We're also glad that you're here on our Zoom presentation. Um, the History of Diving Museum is open every day. Um, go ahead and take this time to, to mute your cell phones because our pirate does have a sword. And Let's I don't think it. he likes technology these days, right? <laughs> It doesn't go with the period piece that we're going to talk about tonight. But um, the History of Diving Museum currently has a featured exhibit open, Aquanauts to Astronauts. It'll be open through the end of the year. So if you haven't been to the museum yet, please be sure to stop in. We say don't drive by, dive in and go through the exhibits. Next month, our Immerse Yourself speaker is gonna be virtual at Sydney Hamilton. She's a commercial astronaut who just went through some aquanaut training and we're gonna hear about her experience as a commercial astronaut. She's an engineer, she's amazing. So third Wednesday of the month um, in July. We wanna thank our sponsors and our members for being here this evening. And we have with us Robert Jacob, who uh, is a historian, pirate, retired Marine. And as you said, you used to be a pirate in real life. Yes. <laughs> uh, author of a couple books, and we're going to hear more about the uh, Florida Pirates and uh, what is it? Myths and Myths, le legends and truths. There you go. Mm -hmm. So enjoy. And if you have any questions, hold them to the end. We'll be having questions here. If uh, you're watching this through Zoom, go ahead and put it into the chat and um, Julia will come in and, and um, read them out to us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, ahoy there, mates, and welcome aboard. My name, my name is Robert Jacob. Uh, I've been a living historian for about 50 years now. I've done all types of uh, time periods. I did Revolutionary War all through the Bicentennial. And recently, as you can see, I appeared on the History Channel's episode of Beyond Oak Island as a pirate expert. They flew me out to Hollywood. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> and I have written two books, A Pirate's Life in the Golden Age of Piracy, which covers all of the pirates from 1625 to 1722, and Pirates of the Florida Coast, Truths, Legends, and Myths. I have both of these books here for sale at the end of the presentation. I hope you will please come up and take a look. And if you'd like to get a copy, I would be delighted to autograph it and make it out to you personally. All right, enough about my commercial. Let's set sail. <laughs> Florida has had a long association with pirates, imaginary and real. And that's kind of obvious by this. <laughs> In case you didn't recognize that, that's the flag of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But how much of that is true? How much of that is just legend or made up? That's what we're going to examine tonight. Now, a little bit of background. The Spanish Main, the Caribbean. It was called the Spanish Main, well, because mainly it belonged to Spain. It was first colonized on the island of Hispaniola by Christopher Columbus himself. That was back in 1494 on his second voyage. From there, they spread all out and took out all of the rest of the islands, Mexico, South America. Now, one of the most important cities was the city of Havana, Cuba. That was the main port in the Caribbean where all vessels departed. Here's why. You see all those little arrows up there. That's the direction that the wind predominantly blows. So if you're a sailing vessel and you're bleeding Havana going up along the Florida Straits, the wind is hitting your vessel from the side. That's good for a sailing boat. But if you try and go between Cuba and Hispaniola, you're sailing directly into the wind. That's bad. That was called the Windward Passage and it was hardly ever used. 95% of every vessel that left the Caribbean sailed right along the Florida coast. That's why there are so many shipwrecks right off everywhere from Key West to up to the North Carolina, because literally every ship went past there. Now, everything was going pretty well for the Spanish until 1625. The wars in Europe caused a lot of refugees. So you had some English, 
French and Dutch refugees all settling on the outer islands. Well, the Spanish hated that. First of all, they weren't Catholic and they weren't even Spanish. But it got really bad on the island of Hispaniola itself. Most of the people in Hispaniola, the Spaniards, were down on the south. So some English and French settlers felt free to kind of invade the North Shore. And they made their living selling pork barbecue. The island was a hunter's paradise. That's what one of them looks like in their hunting outfit. Because Columbus had brought over a lot of pigs 100 years earlier that had escaped into the wild and were breeding without predators. Now, these early settlers would prepare their meat in a technique they learned from the Tayano Indians. You dig a pit and you put a little rack over it. You fill the pit with hot coals, cover the coals with wet spiced leaves. And with the meat on top, it makes a lot of flavorful smoke that smokes the meat, just like they do today. In the Tayano language, that technique was called bukan. So these early settlers became known as bukaneers. <laughs> well, they would set up little shops on the beach and sell their bukan to other people from other settlements that would stop by. And if by chance the Spanish happened to see them, they could simply pack up shop and disappear into the jungles of Hispaniola. But eventually the Spanish kept trying to track them down and kill them. So they settled on the small island of Tortuga, just north of Hispaniola. On this island, they built a fort where they could defend themselves. And they realized we could make more money taking Spanish ships than selling barbecue. So the bucaneers, the hunter-gatherer culture, transformed to a pirate culture and kept the name the Buccaneers. One of these Buccaneers was a man named Robert Cyril. And he is famous because he is the first true pirate to attack Florida. He was cruising on the south uh, tip of Florida in May of 1668 when he came across two Spanish ships. There, they're in the blue. He easily captured them. And from one of the prisoners, he learned about a shipment of silver bars that were being held in St. Augustine. Well, that sounded pretty good to him. So he decided to attack the city. Now he arrived on the 28th of May and sent in his two captured Spanish merchant ships first because nobody would be alarmed. Of course, they had his pirates on board and everybody would just assume here's some merchant ships coming in to trade. At the time, St. Augustine looked about like that. It was a quiet little village. They had a fort, nothing as big as the fort that's there today, but a sizable fort. Then, as darkness fell, he silently crept into the harbor with his other two much larger pirate ships. And when everyone was in place, he opened fire and blasted the beach with artillery shots. Then his pirates swarmed ashore. Now, this was just in a scene like you would see in a Hollywood movie. Pirates running through the streets, killing anybody that got in their way, smashing windows, breaking down doors, taking everything that they wanted to take. Then they got to the fort where the silver bars were. And they said, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. This fort's a little more impressive than we thought it would be. So the next day, they burned the city and left. They got away with 133 silver marks, which is only $36,000 in today's money, divided up 300 ways, that's not a really good take. But they did get 720 yards of canvas and more importantly, 25 pounds of candles. <laughs> As a result of Robert Searle's attack, the Spanish built a new fort, bigger fort, that was capable of defending the harbor. And that fort is still there today. Now, the War of the Spanish Succession, very few people have heard about that war. It took place between 1702 and 1714, and the war was over who gets to be the next king of Spain. The king of Spain died in 1700 with no children, and the two people that were up for the job were his two cousins. One was the grandson of the king of France, and the other was the son of the emperor of Austria. So you could see whoever got to be the ruler of Spain would have a lot of power. And basically, Europe went to war over this. 
Now, the Spanish had a routine treasure route. Once a year, they would send a treasure fleet back from Havana with all of the treasure that had accumulated over that year. But the war scared them. They thought that maybe the British would attack their treasure fleet. So they decided to halt it. And throughout the entire war, not a single treasure ship left Havana, but treasure kept pouring in from everywhere else. So in 1715, when they decided to send the treasure fleet, it was the richest fleet that had ever left the Caribbean. There were thousands of gold and silver bars, millions of gold and silver coins, and eight chests of jewels. And that's only the official report on the manifest. The passengers had tons more treasure, but of course they didn't report. And it was quite common for captains to smuggle a lot of stuff tax-free back to Spain. So this is only a small fraction of what was on this fabulous treasure pool. On July 31st, 1715, the 12 ships of the 1715 treasure fleet were off the coast of Florida. Now, what happens in Florida in July? You got it, hurricanes. And that's exactly what happened. A hurricane came up out of nowhere. One of the ships managed to get away. There he goes. But the other 11 sank, dashed against the shoals and the treasure was sunk forever. Well, not quite. Three of the wrecks were salvageable by the Spanish in 1715, and they brought in some pretty sophisticated diving equipment, very similar to the diving equipment you have on display here in this fabulous museum. They brought in some diving equipment from Havana, Cuba to help salvage some of the treasure. They set up a treasure salvage camp on Sebastian Inlet to box up all this treasure and catalog it and ship it up to, to be sent back to Spain. But they didn't get hardly any, maybe just 10, 15%. Lots and lots of treasure has been recovered over the years, plenty in the 20th century. And this is just a small sampling of some of the 1715 treasure fleet loot that is in museums in the state of Florida. Now you've heard the term pieces of eight a lot. What exactly does that mean? Well, the Spanish had two denominations of money, gold coins and silver coins, pretty easy system. The silver coins were called reales and the gold coins were called escudos. And each coin was worth twice the value of the other coin. So you had a one reale coin, a two reale coin, four reale coin, eight reale coin. And that one escudos coin was twice the value of the eight reale coin. In other words, it was worth double the value, which is why Spanish gold coins were called doubloons. Double, get it? So quite often, if you bought something with your eight reale coin and they didn't have proper change, it was customary to simply cut your coin up and into halves, quarters, eighths, and give you whatever your proper change was. And those pieces of eight were then used as money everywhere else, you know, pieces of eight. Now, the Dutch were always interested in trade with the Spanish. So they came up with a silver coin that exactly matched the eight reale coin. This coin they called the dalder. That way they could trade with the Spanish on equal terms. Well, the English couldn't pronounce dalder, so they started calling it the dollar. And eventually they called the Spanish pieces of eight coin the Spanish dollar. And in 1776, when the US government decided to make its first coin, they made the US dollar that exactly matched the Spanish eight reality coin. Now, sometimes these pieces were called bits which is where two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar comes from. Shaving a haircut, two bits, 25 cents. Price has gone up since then. <laughs> so how much is that worth? Well, you can't really look at the silver weight of a two reale coin and compare it with silver today. It's vastly different. So I use my own personal means of determining value, rum. <laughs> With a two reale coin back then, you could buy a good bottle of rum. 
That cost you about $25 today. Of course, I made this slide a couple months ago. It's probably up to 32 by now. That makes the eight ray alley coin worth about $100 in today's money. Now, Henry Jennings was a pirate from Nassau that heard about the 1715 treasure fleet. In fact, everybody heard about the 1715 treasure fleet. He was just the first one to get there. And he landed about 300 pirates on the beach. That's the spot, actually, where the salvage camp was set up at Sebastian Inlet. Terrific museum there. I highly recommend you go. And he simply walked up the beach and said, give me what you got. And the Spanish said, okay. And he walked away with 36,000 pieces of eight. Then he came back three months later and did the exact same thing again, this time getting 300,000 pieces of eight, which in today's money is $36 million. Uh, I, I see an admit one up there. Uh, Julia, is she going to? There we go. Oh, God. Okay, good. So what do you do with all this money? Well, Henry Jennings went back to Nassau and established a new pirate base. He knew the best way to take money from pirates is willingly. So he invested his money into taverns, brothels, <laughs> uh, places to sell guns, stable stores, and all of the pirates spent their money in his shop. He became so rich that after a couple of years, he bought a plantation in Bermuda. This is the time of the most famous pirates using Nassau as a base. This is the days of Blackbeard, Charles Vane, and Jack Rackham. Unfortunately, most of them didn't come to Florida. Now I want to talk a little bit about some pirate myths and facts. First, we owe a lot to these two pirates, Henry Avery and Thomas II. They were partners in 1694, and they invented the pirate flag. <laughs> All right, so how do they do this? Well, in the 17th century, you had different colored flags that meant different things. The white flag means surrender. Well, it still does today. The yellow flag means disease on board. The black flag was the flag of death. And the red flag meant no quarter. What does that mean, no quarter? It wasn't a pirate flag. It was a military flag used by armies and navies throughout Europe. And it meant surrender now. We're not taking prisoners. If you don't surrender now, you will die no quarter will be given. And the buccaneers on Tortuga always used the red flag. Now the French used to call it the happy red flag. That's just so typical in French. I don't, there's nobody French from France and that's insulted by that. Uh, so they would say, let's raise the happy red flag. And in French, that's Jolie Rouge, which is why their English partners started calling it the Jolly Roger. Well, in 1694, Henry Avery and Thomas II were using their red flag of no quarter, but they recognized the importance of branding and name recognition. They wanted people to know who they were because famous pirates attacking, I'm gonna surrender. So they decorated their flags with distinctive emblems. And for some reason, no one knows why, they decided to use a black background instead of a red. Perhaps it looks more intimidating. Perhaps their emblem could be seen better. At any rate, throughout the next century, the pirate flag was born. And every pirate used his own distinctive, uniquely designed flag for name recognition. The most famous is Blackbeard's flag, which is kind of unique. It's the skeleton of the devil holding a spear and a bleeding heart and in the other hand, he's holding an hourglass as if to say, your time is running out. Pretty good flag. So. All right, pirate or privateer. There's a huge difference between the two. Of course, to victims, there wouldn't be any difference at all. Help, help, I was attacked by pirates. But to the individual, it meant the difference between being welcomed home as a hero or being hanged. A privateer is a legal pirate. They have documents called letters of mark, which was issued to them by a government official that gave them permission to attack ships from nations listed in, the, in those letters. So if England and Spain were not on good terms, as generally was the case, an English official would issue letters of mark allowing them to attack Spanish ships. 
And in return, 25% of the take went back to the English government, 10% directly to the guy that issued him those letters. So it was a great incentive for governors to make a fortune. Henry Morgan was never a pirate. He was always a privateer operating with letters of mark from Governor Thomas Monaford. Arr, mateys. All pirates say R, don't they? In fact, I've heard about 17 jokes today about the subject R. Like, what's the pirate's favorite letter? It isn't R, it's the C. Right. So where does R come from? Did pirates really talk like that? Came from him. <laughs> that is Robert Newton. He was a Shakespearean actor that was hired by Disney to play Long John Silver in Disney's 1950 adaption of Treasure Island. And he brought that persona to his character. Then he made a sequel and had a TV series that ran in 1956. And he was so beloved that he became the quintessential pirate. Every kid wanted to talk like Long John Silver with the R matey. So where does he get that? Well, in England, they say I a lot, it means yes. They say that as often as we say, okay, which for some people is every other word. And some cultures put an R where they don't belong. Like that's a good idea. No, there's no R in idea. Or I'm going to wash the clothes. There's no R in wash. Well, if you put an R in the I, it comes out R. And the people in Bristol did that. He wasn't using a pirate accent. He was using a Bristol accent. The most predominant seaport in Great Britain. And interestingly enough, this person, Robert Newton, was from Bristol. So perhaps his uncle talks that way. But it's not a pirate accent, it's a Bristol accent. <laughs> oh, Amelia Island on the north of Florida, right along the Georgia border, has a long pirate tradition. And you can kind of see why. Uh, well, I wish we could. So there, the ship has been captured. Now, oh, we're good again. So Amelia Island will tell you about three pirates that use Amelia Island as a base. Captain Kidd, Blackbeard, and Lafitte. But is that true? Well, Captain Kidd, contrary to popular belief, only committed one act of piracy in his entire life. He was actually a businessman from New York City before he decided to go to the Indian Ocean uh, with letters of mark, and he captured one ship illegally and was charged for piracy and hanged. So he never used any place as a base. And certainly he may have passed to Amelia Island, but it's very unlikely he stopped there to bury him in treasure. There was a Franciscan mission there at the time. So I'd have to say that's false. Well, what about Blackbeard? We know more about Blackbeard than perhaps any other pirate because he's so famous. We know where he was pretty much every minute of his career as a pirate, which only lasted 10 months. He sailed past Amelia Island a couple times, but never stopped there and did not have any opportunity to bury any treasure there. So I would have to say that's false. And what about Jean Lafitte? Well, he spent most of his career in New Orleans, and he had a lot of pirates, and some of his pirates may have smuggled some stolen merchandise into Georgia through Amelia Island. That's very likely. But he himself never would have been in the Atlantic Ocean and certainly wouldn't have used Amelia Island as a base. So I have to say, that's false. Okay, so where do all of these stories come from? Fishing guides. <laughs> In the 1880s, when Florida's tourist fishing industry took off, the fishing guides with the best pirate stories got the best clients. They actually tried to outdo each other with outlandish stories of pirates. And you can just see them as they're fishing out there. You see that cove over there? That's where Blackbeard the pirate buried his treasure. And then they started selling fake treasure maps. When Florida's automobile tourist industry took off in the 1960s, the locals just kept telling the stories. And now they're on a lot of websites and tourist information. But there was one individual that actually was a pirate that used Amelia Island. So he was a French privateer. And it was actually one of Jean Lafitte's pirates at Barataria as early as 1811. 
Now, Simon Bolivar was leading a revolution in 1808 to take South America away from Spain. And by 18, or 1817, things weren't going too well. He needed a distraction. He needed to pull Spain's attention away. So he hired uh, Louis Michael Ori to kind of lead an invasion in Florida. He thought that would do it. So this was his plan. Ori was to sail up there with three ships. Meanwhile, some Americans that were recruited would attack from Georgia and they hoped to conquer all of Florida and make it a brand new free nation. So on June, 1817, about 150 Americans crossed the border and captured the small Spanish fort on Amelia Island, Fort San Carlos. But where was Ari? He was late. So they couldn't go any further. It wasn't until September where Ari finally showed up. And with the firepower of his ships, he blasted the Spanish away but then double-crossed everybody and turned pirate. He decided not to go through with his plan. He kicked the Americans out and set up Amelia Island as his own private pirate base. Between September and December, he could sail from Amelia Island and get ships coming up through the Florida Straits. Or if they were coming down, he could also ambush them from his little base on Amelia Island. He even could get ships coming in from the South. He was controlled the ocean for three months and accumulated about $1.8 million. And that's in 1817 money. That'd be considerably more. Well, it all went wrong for him on the 23rd of December, 1817, when the USS John Adams showed up to put a stop to it. Now they had no jurisdiction to attack Spanish, but they did it anyway. They searched for evidence that he had attacked a US ship, couldn't find it. They searched for evidence that he had smuggled goods into Georgia, couldn't find it. So after all that time by February, they had to let him go for lack of evidence. And he returned to the Caribbean. Well, what about the $1.8 million? They never found it. Maybe it's still buried on Amelia Island. He certainly didn't take it with him. And the US government, even though they searched, couldn't find it. But locals dig up treasure all the time. In fact, I met a man at a bar and just casually talking to him, he had those two pictures on a cell phone of stuff that he dug up in his backyard. And he said he's got about 30 or 40 more artifacts that he found on his property in the Maya Island. So who knows? Now, your closest pirate to here is the famous Black Caesar, who operated out of Elliot's Key. And you can see, oh, first of all, about his name. Some sources say that his name was Henry Caesar and that he started operations in 1804, that he had been a slave on the island of Haiti. But in 1804, they had the slave revolt. And part of the slave revolt, he managed to capture a French merchant ship and turn to piracy. Now, there's another story that he was with Blackbeard. Well, that was... 18, or 1718, like 90 years earlier, uh, there was a man named Black Caesar who was arrested as part of Blackbeard's crew when he was killed at Ocracoke in 1817. But it, that's more like some people just mixing up the name mistakenly. So let's just rule out the Blackbeard, uh, Black Caesar guy. So from his base on Elliot's Key, he could easily ambush ships coming up through the Florida Straits. And he was known as a very bloodthirsty pirate. He killed everyone except the attractive women, which he kept for a short period of time and then eventually killed them too. That's why nobody knows very much about it because no one survived it. And he had between two and $6 million of treasure that he buried and he buried it right there on Elliot's Key or maybe it was on Pine Island or maybe Whitehorse Key or maybe Marco Island, or you know, there might have been Sanibel Island. So far, they haven't found anything that he has ever buried. Then he became partners with the famous Jose Gaspar of the Tampa Bay Gasparilla Festival. Now, Jose Gaspar was an admiral in the Spanish Navy. And in 1783, he was appointed to the court of the King of Spain as their naval attache. 
Now, he was quite the ladies' man, and he started a love affair with a woman named Maria Luisa, which is stupid because she was the wife of the king's son and future queen of Spain. Well, eventually he thought that was pretty silly and he broke off the relationship and married someone else and had two children. But Maria Luisa got mad. She liked Jose Gaspar and liked the little affair. So she convinced the prime minister, Manuel Godoy, to kind of take Jose Gaspar out, but he did it in a very flamboyant style. He framed him for stealing the crown jewels. Then he went to his house, burned it to the ground, killed his wife and two children. Well, Jose Gaspar left vowing vengeance and came to Florida on his vessel, the Flora Blanca. He settled on the island of Boca Grande, thought it'd be a nice place, and renamed it Gasparilla Island after himself. His crew settled on a small island right behind that had a large Indian burial mound so they could kind of see ships coming in the distance. And pretty soon he joined partners with Black Caesar who established his base on Pine Island. Then Sanibel Island, who was named for the girlfriend of his first officer, attracted other pirate crews. Now, Captiva Island has a very infamous reputation. Like Black Caesar, he would kill all of the male captives and he would kill all of the unattractive females, but the attractive ones he would keep for his own personal harem on Captiva Island. Captive, Captiva, get it? But he only had room for so many. So each time he added a new person, someone had to die. And then there's Giuseppa Island, named after a Spanish princess that he fell in love with. But when she refused his affections, in a fit of rage, he took out his sword and cut off her head. Then felt bad about it. So he buried her with full honors and named the island after her. Then eventually he became partners with the famous Jean Lafitte. And they accumulated about $30 million, which they buried on Boca Grande. Well, in 1821, Florida became a US territory and they realized the US is not gonna allow them to stay there like the Spanish did. So one by one, all of his pirates began to leave. Black Caesar was among the first. And by the spring of 1822, he only had one pirate captain left, Jean Lafitte, with about 70 men. Now they were sitting on a beach having a party. This was the last night of their partnership. They were gonna dig up the treasure and split and go their separate ways the next day. When suddenly they saw this large ship just begging to be taken, sailing close by. They couldn't resist the opportunity to take just one more vessel. So the order was given, man the masts. And the men rushed to the ship and sped up after them. They left 10 men behind to guard the treasure. And there they go. Well, Jose Gaspar in the Flora Blanca was the first to uh, catch up and he fired a warning shot across the bow of that ship to get them to heave to. Then suddenly the stars and stripes were raised because in fact, that was the USS Enterprise, the largest US warship in the waters. And the gun ports of the em Enterprise opened and a thunderous roar as guns raked the deck of the Flora Blanca, killing half his crew. Well, Gaspar knew it was all over. And so he tied an anchor to himself and shouted, Gasparilla dies by his own hand, not the enemy's. And with that, he jumped overboard, sinking into oblivion. Well, Sean, the feet, and the other vessel watching in horror was what was happening, tried to get away, but he was caught by another US warship a little bit further north and his crew had to jump ship and disappeared into the jungles of Florida. And what about his treasure? Well, it still remains buried somewhere on Gasparilla Island. Okay, now the truth. None of that was true. <laughs> yeah, the USS Enterprise was an active warship, but it was always in Cuban waters. It never went into the Gulf of Mexico. And the quick check of the logbook says there was never any action with anything with a pirate named Gasparilla or anything resembling what was described in the story. In fact, there is no historical evidence that Jose Gaspar ever lived at all. There is no record of him in Spain. There is no record of any report by anybody named Jose Gaspar taking ships in Florida in 1821. Oh, what about Mary Louisa and Manuel Godoy? Well, they were real people. 
But the guy that wrote the story didn't really check the dates very well because Manuel Godoy was prime minister of Spain, but in 1783, he was 12 years old. Now you'll see Gasparilla Island already got its name by 1774, where it appears on a map a long time before Jose got there. It was probably named after a Franciscan friar who had a small mission nearby. And what about Black Caesar, his partner? There's actually no historical evidence that he ever existed either. The earliest reference we can positively find about Black Caesar is a book written in 1922 called Black Caesar's Clan. It's a really odd book about a guy that's walking his calling on the beach and he finds a homeless man that tells him a story about buried pirate treasure and they go off looking for it together. So from there, the stories have been spun by fishing guides and others that want to build a whole legend about pirates in the local community. What about Jean Lafitte? He was real, but when he was supposed to be with Jose Gaspar, it was well-documented, he was operating off of Mujeres, Mexico. And then when the famous battle with the Enterprise took place, it was well-documented that he was actually in Cuba. In fact, he was in a prison in Cuba in February of 1822. So what's the truth about Jose Gaspar? Well, the name first appears in Tampa in 1900 where a man named Ricardo the Mystic, who is a vaudeville hypnotist, started running a seance scam. Pay him some money and contact the ghost of Gasparilla to find out whether his treasure was buried. Well, the police broke that up and seance scam went away until 1904 when merchants in Tampa said, what can we do to make a lot of money? Like Mardi Gras. Let's have a pirate parade and pirate ball. And this was originally in May. So they invented the mystic crew of Gasparilla to put the whole thing together. And they came up with this mysterious pirate named Gasparilla. There's the newspaper article announcing the very first pirate parade involved. And Edwin D. Lambright wrote the first backstory on who this pirate was. Who was he? He was a member of the mystic crew of Gasparilla and the managing editor of the Tampa Morning Tribune. Now, a few years later in 1907, a phosphate mine was discovered on the island of Boco Grande, where Gasparilla was supposedly from, and they built a railroad spar down to the island. The president of the railroad was a man named Robert Bradley, and he fell in love with the place, bought the entire island, and in addition to being in the railroad business, went into the real estate business. One thing he did is built this fabulous resort inn at the end of the railroad tracks called Gasparilla Inn still there today, and it's a fabulous resort. You'll pay about four or 500 a night to stay there. Mm -hmm. Now, his timing was perfect because this was the first year that Gasparilla Festival was going to be its own standalone event, 1913. So we thought everything I can do to publicize my inn will help the festival. I'll sell railroad tickets. People will come to my island. It's a win-win for everybody. So to publicize his inn, he hired a man named Pat Lemoyne to write the detailed backstory of Jose Gaspar that appeared in a brochure for the inn. This is where the Captiva Island and the females came from, the little princess named Josepha, the bloodthirsty, all of those stories were the invention of Pat Lemoyne for that brochure. He attributed his source to a man named Panther John Gomez, who had died 13 years earlier. Now, who was he? Fishing guide from the Thousand <laughs> Islands who told tons of pirate stories. There's no proof that he ever told a story about Jose Gaspar, but he had tons of stories about pirates. And in this version, he had him actually being one of Jose Gaspar's crew members, which would have made him 126 when he died. <laughs> he was one of the 10 men that was left behind to guard the treasure. <laughs> but they never explained why those 10 men didn't dig up the treasure. <laughs> And, yeah, and the $30 million is still buried there on Boca Grande. Now, if you're a real estate agent, can you think of a better gimmick? There's $30 million buried somewhere. No one knows where. Maybe the plot of land you buy will have the money. And plus, he's gift shops uh, at the inn filled with buckets and shovels so the kids could go out on the beach and dig for it. 
we know exactly what the brochure says because it was reprinted in the Tampa Daily Times in 1917. And who was Gas Brilla? And it even quotes the Charlotte Harbor Northern Railroad in the byline. So there's the truth. Pat Lemoy later said the whole thing was a cockeyed lie. He made it up based upon what tourists like to hear. But it does a lot of good. So long live Gasparilla, long may he reign. Now let's get closer to home. Baca Key. You know where Baca Key is? Pretty, pretty close here, too. There were wreckers there. The head wrecker was a man named Joshua Appleby. All right, so what are wreckers? Well, they kind of build false lights on the beach at night that makes it look like it's a port or a safe entryway. And ships coming by would be fooled by the lights, head towards them, and then run aground onto a sand lot. Then the next morning, they could row out in little pirate rowboats and take the ship. Not very glamorous, but <laughs> technically they were still pirates. Well, then an incident happened in December of 1818. There was a ship called the Emma Sophia that was on its way to New Orleans and it just happened to be passing Bimini when a pirate ship came out and captured it. Now they didn't want to loot the ship right there because it was a busy shipping channel. Somebody might see them. So they took the ship to Key Largo to loot it right off the coast here. Now, while they did, they really threatened to hang the captain, if he didn't tell them where the treasure was, put a rope around his neck, start. Now, this was unusual. Pirates, contrary to popular belief, very rarely killed their passengers, their, their victims. It was bad for business. If you know you're going to be killed by a pirate, you're going to fight. But if you feel that, OK, they're going to steal everything, but I'll at least live, you'll give up easily. That was routine for pirates. This crossed the line, his treatment of the captain on this one vessel to try and get him to tell where they had buried the treasure. And that report went back to Congress. Now, at the time in 1821, pretty much everybody was revolting against Spain. Here you have the Spanish empire, but the first to go was that area which became the country of Colombia. Then old Spanish Mexico became independent Mexico. Hispaniola, the capital of the Spanish Caribbean, revolted too and became the Dominican Republic. And even Florida, Spain sold Florida to the United States. There they go. So by this time, Spain only had two possessions left in the Caribbean, Cuba and Puerto Rico. Now, while the Spanish had a strong presence there, they could kind of keep piracy under control. But now the Spanish Navy was gone. With just those two possessions, they were busy fighting wars elsewhere. All the revolutionary countries weren't strong enough to fight anybody. So the pirates felt empowered and enabled. And using Cuba and Puerto Rico with friendly governments that didn't mind the pirates being there, they established a whole new base of Spanish pirates that were quite vicious. And for a short period of time, a new golden age of piracy occurred and pirates were everywhere in the Caribbean. Now an event, an event took place in May of 1822 when the blessing was captured by one of those Cuban pirates who killed half the crew. And they did it by making them walk the plank. This is the first time in documented history where people actually walked the plank. That had not occurred before this. So this was a step in a new direction for pirates. Then in June of 1822, a ship named the Mary was heading down towards New Orleans when it was intercepted by pirates right off the Keys. Now I don't have any graphics for this, but I'll just tell you that every member of the crew was killed in absolutely horrible ways. Worse than I hope you can imagine. And it looked like all of the passengers were about to be killed too when they saw another ship coming and thought, huh, well, we better leave now with what we've got. So they blasted a hole in the side of the Mary and sped off, leaving the ship to sink and drowned all of the passengers. Fortunately, 
The other ship got there in time and was at, at, able to rescue the passengers who told their story before the United States Congress and said, something's gotta be done. So the US started their anti-piracy operation and mobilized pretty much the entire fleet into the Caribbean to try and stamp out piracy. That's a ship of the USS Enterprise who actually was one of their most valuable ships and sank off the keys very close to where we are now by accident, ran aground in the storm. Now there was a problem with the US Navy warships because they were bigger and heavier and had deeper draft and the pirates knew this. So the pirates could sail over territory and get away that the US could not follow. Make sense? Well, they brought in Commodore David Porter. He was the right man for the job, and he was going to fix all of this. The first thing he did is he broke up the fleet. He only kept seven of the original ships and only three big ones. The other were, were kind of small. And then he had eight specially designed shallow draft schooners built so that he could chase the pirates. Then he added the very first steam powered vessel to the US Navy, the USS Seagull. There's a water coloring of it. And this was great because it was faster and could head straight into the wind and catch the pirates. Now he established his base at Key West. It was the easiest spot to get to all of the Cuban pirates. And his new Navy was called the Mosquito Squadron. No need to explain that to you. <laughs> The first thing he did was break up the records at Baca Key. He sailed over there and had Joshua Appleby arrested and closed down all of their wrecking operations. Well, then something very unfortunate happened to the Commodore. See, there was a yellow fever epidemic in Key West at the time, and he got yellow fever. And you know how when you're sick, doctors say you can't eat this and you can't drink that? Well, the doctors came to Commodore Porter and said, Commodore, you have four hours to live. We're gonna let you eat or drink anything you want. So he ordered a mojito, uh, he ordered a uh, mint julep. And a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. And by the next morning, he had made a full recovery. And he always attributed that to the mint juleps. From Key West, he launched his anti-piracy operations against the bases in Cuba. One by one, they were attacked by the US Navy. And now Spanish Cuba was not complaining anymore because the diplomatic relationship was too bad. Then in 1825, the Royal Navy from Great Britain joined in and together the two nations formed anti-piracy groups that was devastating. So the last phase of the Pirates of the Caribbean was over. Do I have any questions? Ah, thank you. <laughs> where, where were they sending all the treasure out from? So which city, where it's all come from South America? And right, so you had, uh, the question was, where were the Spanish getting their treasure that they were sending back to Spain? So you had most of the silver that was being mined in Bolivia. In fact, most coins that the Spanish used in Europe came from Bolivia, came from the mints in Bolivia. They had tons of gold from Mexico, all of the treasure from the Aztecs, all of the gold from the Incas. That would all be taken to the city of Panama, as well as all the riches from the Philippines, jewels, pearls, uh, spices that would all be sent to Panama, which is why Panama was the richest city on the Pacific. It would all be carried across the Isthmus of Panama by mule caravans, taken to uh, Santo Domingo to be cataloged and recorded, and then shipped to Havana. In addition, uh, uh, there were tremendous vast resources coming from South America. A lot of that was foodstuffs, but there was a certain amount of gold and silver coming in from what is now Colombia. Yes, ma'am. Was part of their Booty or their, that they were stealing uh, shells from like the shelling, global shelling industry at that, at that time in history? Uh, the question was, was some of their booting in the shell trade? 
I'm not aware that the shell trade was very lucrative during that time. I'm not, maybe I'm incorrect. I've never studied the shell trade, but it, it may have been. And if shells were valuable, I'm sure that was part of their treasury. Yes, ma'am. In the last place of piracy, when the Spaniard students cared too much and started to mm -hmm. have piracy, too, did they have letters of more as well, or they so, just sent for pirates? So the question was during the last phase where Spain was sympathetic towards the pirates operating out of Cuba, did they have letters of mark? No, they didn't, because uh, that would have been too much of a diplomatic incident at the time. The Spanish were kind of annoyed at the United States and Great Britain, because during all of these revolutions that were funded by privateers, the privateers were selling all of their merchandise in the United States. And the United States wasn't doing anything to stop that. In fact, they were welcoming it. So Spain kind of was annoyed at America and just decided, I'm not gonna do anything about these pirates. We'll just let them go and it's good, good for the Americans. Well, then pressure from Europe caused them to rethink that. And so then slowly they started, okay, we'll let the US attack them. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. How did the pirates affect the slave trade? Uh, very interesting comment. So slave ships make the best pirate ships because they're big and they're fast. They're built specifically to go across the ocean very quickly. Otherwise your cargo has a tendency to die. And they've got lots of sleeping space down below. Now, a regular ship would have a crew of maybe 30. On a pirate ship, you had three to 400 pirates. Where are they going to sleep? So anytime a slave ship could be captured, it was. Blackbeard's ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, was a slave ship. What happened to the slaves? A lot of them wound up being pirates. During Blackbeard's day, 40% of all pirate crews were of African descent and they were equal opportunity employers. They had the same privileges. Uh, in fact, Sam Bellamy's quartermaster who was a former slave from the slave ship. He had captured a couple months earlier. Uh, by the 19th century, it was different because now the slave trade was illegal in the US. You could not import any slaves into America. So the only way to get new slaves in was to smuggle them in. So now the pirates, when they took slave ships, they smuggled them into the United States. And even though half their crews were former Africans, that didn't matter. Let's make money. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us how the uh, riches that were taken were divided among the crew? The question is, how did pirates divide their riches? So tradition with true pirates, traditionally, all of the cash would be divided into shares. And different members of the crew would rate different amounts of share. A lower sea, lowest seaman would get one share. A ship surgeon might get four shares. The captain would get six shares. But all of the merchandise, the clothing, the guns, the jewelry, would all go into a common storage area. And once the crew got all their money, they would auction off that merchandise to their crew at what they call the sale before the mast. So the crewmen that offered the most amount of money would be able to buy the fanciest coat, the nicest sword, if he outbid everybody else. Uh, yes. Hi, so I have some questions from Henry Baldwin. Um, one question is, uh, who in reality, not folklore, was the most bloodthirsty pirate? The question is, who in reality was the most bloodthirsty pirate, excluding folklore? Uh, Roberts, John Roberts. Uh, he lived, he was a successful pirate between 1719 and 1722, and he turned psychopath. He became your typical Hollywood pirate, killing his own crew for disobeying the slightest order, torturing people. He is what caused the end of the golden age of piracy. He was so feared that he became public enemy number one. The entire Royal Navy was out to get him. And with John Roberts, their tolerance of pirates was over. Another question was, um, did the Pirates of the Caribbean ever operate in other areas of the world? Was it around or say? Did, did the Pirates, question is, did the Pirates of the Caribbean ever operate in other places of the world? All the time. In fact, it was very routine after you had some success in the Caribbean. Well, let's go over to Africa 
and hit some of the ships coming out of the African Gold Coast. Uh, a lot of the pirates like Henry Emery and Thomas too left the Caribbean and went to the Indian Ocean uh, for pickings. Oliver, uh, Olivier Levasseur, who was Blackbeard's partner for a short period of time, left the Caribbean and went to the Indian Ocean. And uh, John Roberts, he would leave the Caribbean, go up and attack cities in Newfoundland, then went back to the Caribbean, then went to Africa, then back to the Caribbean, and then back to Africa where he was killed. Other questions? So this is my question was, um, so what exactly do you think was the catalyst for making pirates and Asian countries more violent than the British? So you said- Yes, you know, they, what was the catalyst for making them more violent? Because for the first time, they were looked upon as true evil villains, where all the ports were closed to them except their own little pirate base. Before that, if you were a privateer, you were legal in the eyes of a lot of people. Jean Lafitte was never wanted for piracy. He always had letters of mark. So when you hear stories about the government was after Jean Lafitte for piracy, no. They were after him for not paying taxes. It was an IRS beef because he was smuggling his merchandise into New Orleans without paying customs. So it was a tax issue. So a lot of these pirates with letters of mark behaved themselves because it was part of the deal with getting letters of mark. When all that went away, there were no more pirate friendly cities. There were no more letters of mark. Now pirates were truly evil people that would be hanged if they were caught. Let's get rid of all the witnesses. Dead men tell no tales. Person yes. Asked, well, have any comments on Sir Francis Drake? Sir Francis Drake was a privateer, uh, the most successful privateer of all time. At when Francis Drake lived, Great Britain really didn't have a navy, or England didn't have a navy. Uh, they had maybe two or three ships. Their entire defense force was made up of privateers, and they were kind of in a cold war with Spain, virtually, uh, even though war wasn't declared. They were attacking each other all the time. And Francis Drake was the most successful. He sacked St. Augustine in Florida in uh, 1586, very successfully after he took Santo Domingo and Cartagena. Yes, ma'am. Were there successful female pirates? There were two female pirates <laughs> that are well documented and that's Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed. Uh, most of what you read about them is incorrect. We really don't know anything about them before the summer of 1720 when they were raiding with Jack Rackham south of Cuba. They were captured in October. Jack Rackham's entire crew were executed. The two females were released because they were both pregnant and you couldn't execute a pregnant woman. Uh, Mary Reed died shortly after that. She was buried in St. Catherine's Church, probably during childbirth. Anne Bonny disappeared from the record, but strangely enough, a woman named Anne Bonny was buried in that same cemetery at St. Catharines in Jamaica in 1736. So there's no proof it's the same Anne Bonny, but it is compelling. As far as successful goes, during this time period, we have to go to the, the female pirate in the, uh, the Chinese female pirate to go to the successful female pirate. She operated out of my time period. Anything else? No, yes, sir. How is the, is, is there any truth about the community of piracy that they uh, had some kind of like a retirement fund? Or? Yes, they did. Um, all ships had uh, what they call ship's articles, which guaranteed certain payment, like 500 pieces of eight for the loss of an arm. Oh. So they had medical plans for <laughs> their, their <laughs> Better than ours. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so you got your, your shares and so forth if you were injured. Couple more, yes, ma'am. Who had the longest career? It seems like a lot of them died very, you know, they had three months, six months, 10 months yeah, a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, if you want to go with privateers, including them, it's got to be Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan was very successful for about 12 years. Um, uh, you know, some of your longest pirates are like about two years, yeah. but uh, there was one named John Taylor who was a nasty pirate. Uh, and after five years, got so much treasure in the Indian Ocean, bought a plantation in South America and retired. Yeah, some didn't. Yeah. Anything else? Well, please come up and take a look at my books uh, at this presentation. And I will be signing them and addressing them to you if you get a copy and we do take credit cards. <laughs>
thank you so much for being here. Um, as a thank you, we give oh, you thank you very and much. your wonderful uh, wife or uh, wench wow, <laughs> <friend. Yeah. laughs> a, a one year membership. You can actually come to the museum 362 days that we are open every year uh, right now and you know enjoy the different exhibits. We do want to thank Key Dives who was our sponsor for tonight and if anybody out there would like to talk about Immerse Yourself sponsorship email director at divingmuseum.org. If you're watching this later on on YouTube uh, and you have a question put it in the comment box and we'll mm -hmm. forward it on to Robert to get some more information. So thank you and uh, we'll see you next time.